Hi, I'm Zach Dobson, professional documentary and commercial photographer. I have the opportunity to shoot with some new Fujifilm gear. And there's so many places on YouTube and other places where you can go to get, you know, all the specs and compare side-by-side uh, -side images and things like that. But what I really want to talk about is what is it actually like to shoot with the camera? Uh, I'm a working professional photographer. Um, I do commercial work, editorial. So, um, and I've been in business for about 20 years now. <laughs> so what I wanna do in these reviews is to um, really address like, what's it like to use the camera functionally? And I'll include links uh, down below for, you know, where you can go if you really wanna do an analysis of the image quality of one camera versus another camera. So, and um, you know, one of the things is I had the opportunity with Fujifilm to try out this camera for a few weeks. Now the lens is mine, this is my lens. I tried out the X-Pro3 and um, the 56 uh, F1.2. So I'll be doing like a video about this camera and this lens. But, so I'm gonna do the, what I really wanna do with my camera reviews or gear reviews when I do them, if I do them more than this, is to just talk about what it's like to actually use them. Because honestly, realistically speaking, most of the cameras are gonna produce very good images, especially if you're talking about things in the, you know, $1,200, $1,500, $2,000 price range. So much of it comes down to what does it feel like to use? What do you like about it? What's the actual functionality of it? Um, so that's kind of what I wanna talk about. And so I'm gonna go back and forth, I'm gonna record some segments that I'll use on the YouTube review, but I'll also answer questions as best I can in between. So I'll probably do another take at the intro here, and then um, I'll keep an eye out, and if you have any specific questions about um, the camera or anything like that, then you can ask. So, um, yeah, so this is the camera I'm gonna be talking about, the X-Pro3. I used it with my 23 millimeter lens, which is a, a 35 millimeter full frame equivalent. So, um, cause this has a 1.5 crop sensor. And then this is the other lens I used with Fujifilm, this nice big, uh, here, the uh, 1.2 is a cool, you know, piece of glass for sure. I get my face in here. Um, yeah, I need to do that on my GoPro. So I'm trying, uh, I have this whole setup since I'm gonna post this on YouTube also, um, but I can answer questions about that. So I'm gonna give this intro a quick go. So I guess this is also kind of behind the scenes of the recording process. So I am gonna come back and answer some of these questions. I'm gonna take a quick go at this intro. Um, so, all right. Hi, I'm Zach Dobson, I'm a professional commercial and editorial photographer. I had the opportunity to shoot with this X-Pro3 Fujifilm sent me for three weeks. And what I wanna do with this camera review is really talk about what it's like to use the camera because there's so many places you can go and get specs and compare images and yada, yada, yada. But I wanna talk about the functionality, what it feels like to shoot with it. Um, as a working professional, what did I like about it? What didn't I like about it? Um, I personally have, this is my camera that I own, um, the Fujifilm X-T20, and I've had this for five years. It's been a great camera. I've been interested in trying the um, X-Pro series and the X-T series. I've used the X-100. I ran it a couple different times for trips that I took, and um, I've really had a great experience. So I bought the X-T20 because I wanted the compact size plus interchangeable lenses that the X100 doesn't have the interchangeable lenses. So this um, is the same style, the rangefinder style as the um, X100, but it does have the interchangeable lens. Now this lens that I have, my 23 millimeter is the same equivalent of a lens that they have on the X100 series. So, um, okay. I mean, that's kind of an intro. We'll see if that works well enough. I'll cut some of this stuff out. Um, the X-T2 is, I haven't used the X-T2. This, this, my X-T20 is a similar, it's the same kind of SLR style. 
and I like this camera a lot. So um, some of the stuff that I'll talk about on here might be kind of splitting hairs a little bit. Now I'm going to talk, <laughs> I've got a camera right next to this here. So I might look sometimes I'm talking to that camera because that's the video that's going to go up on YouTube mostly because I've posted some of these lives up on YouTube and people are like, oh, I don't like the vertical format. So I'm trying to record on my GoPro and horizontal and do this in vertical. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. This is all new. Um, I do. So what I shoot is um, my, for my client work, my professional work, I use my uh, Canon gear. I have a couple 5D Mark III's um, and my primary lenses that I use are 24 1.4, a 50 1.4 and uh, 70 to 200 2.8. So that's my primary kit that I use for like commercial gigs. I wasn't shooting much on a regular basis, so I bought this X-T20 five years ago, um, and I've been shooting all the time with it. So a lot of the stuff you see, I, hi, I'm Zach Dobson, I'm a professional commercial and editorial photographer. I had the opportunity to shoot with this X-Pro3 Fujifilm sent me for three weeks. And what I wanna do with this camera review is really talk about what it's like to use the camera, because there's so many places you can go and get specs and compare images and yada, yada, yada. But I wanna talk about the functionality, what it feels like to shoot with it. Um, as a working professional, what did I like about it? What didn't I like about it? Um, I personally have, this is my camera that I own, um, the Fujifilm X-T20. And I've had this for five years. It's been a great camera. I've been interested in trying the um, X-Pro series and the X-T series. I've used the X100. I ran it a couple different times for trips that I took and um, I've really had a great experience. So I bought the X-T20 because I wanted the compact size plus interchangeable lenses that the X100 doesn't have the interchangeable lenses. So this um, is the same style, the rangefinder style as the um, X100, but it does have the interchangeable lens. Now this lens that I have, my 23 millimeter, is the same equivalent of a lens that they have on the X100 series. So overall, I'd say this is an excellent camera. I've been using Fujifilm for five years personally. I love the build quality. I love the look of it. And that counts for something. It feels good to shoot with a camera that looks cool. I mean, just we have to admit that. Uh, it's a good looking camera. This one looks especially good. I love that it doesn't have the branding on the front. It's just on the top. Um, I mean, and the build quality is, is just excellent. Um, the other things I like about it are, you know, it's not too much bigger than the X-T20, which I have been using for a long time and I like a lot. So the size is really pretty good. It's smaller than, than the Canon D DSLRs I've used for a long time. And um, the benefit, so let's talk practical benefits of these things. The benefit of having a camera that's more compact like this is that especially if you want to do something like street photography, it doesn't stand out like a big DSLR. Um, you can be more, uh, you know, inconspicuous. You can be more low key. People aren't paying attention to you. And that's a benefit as far as usability goes, because you can get more uh, candid style of images. When I travel, if I want to take pictures in a restaurant that I'm dining at, you know, nobody pays attention. I just look like a tourist with a camera, a nice camera, uh, taking pictures in the restaurant. Um, any anything like that museums uh, tourist attractions you just don't attract attention to yourself which is nice so some of the features some of the features that I like about this camera especially you know I'll compare it to my X-T20 um, mechanical shutter speed this one goes up to one eight thousandth this one is one fourth thousandth and I will say that extra stop comes in handy because there's a lot of times I'm shooting outside in the daylight and I want to shoot at F2 and it's right at the cusp, you know, four, one four thousand is slightly overexposing, but one eight, <laughs> one eight thousandth really gets me where I want to be, um, you know, exposure wise. So that is a benefit. Um, the other benefits are the ISO is really handy um this iso you know it goes down to so this one the the xt20 line goes to um 
200 and it has like a low setting that's 100 but it just skips from 200 to 100 whereas this one has a third of a stop increments all the way down to iso 80 and that 80 is really nice it's really nice to be able to shoot at iso 80. Um, another thing i like functionally are there are so many customizable buttons i mean everywhere you go there's a button you know here on the top there's um a couple buttons here on the back um, this one's preset to the film simulations. This is the quick menu. Um, you know, you can change your autofocus and, and, and drive is here real quick. Uh, I like the multi-directional controller on here. It makes it a lot easier for me to select my focus points as opposed to, you know, here it doesn't have, you know, it has the buttons, but, um, and they work fine, but the multi-directional controller really works well, I think. Okay, so question about picture quality between the mechanical and the electronic shutter. Here's my experience between the two. A lot of times I would shoot with the setting on the camera that keeps you at the mechanical until the shutter speed gets so high that it goes beyond the capabilities of mechanical and then it switches you over to electronic shutter. Um, and I've had pretty good experiences with that, but I have to say, so we know about the, um, electronic shutter uh, where it causes like things that are moving to warp. I'm going to like put that in when I do the video, I'll put that in above, whatever that's called. I can't think of what it's called. So if you're shooting something that's moving really fast, the example that I've seen is like you're shooting a helicopter, which is a really common occurrence, of course. But um, when you're in the electronic shutter, the way it like rolls the, the, to get the picture, it causes the, the blades look like warped, not just like motion blur. You can actually see they look like bent significantly. So the faster the object, the more pronounced that um, problem is. But I, I'm not generally shooting something that falls into that sort of problem. But what I do notice is like a subtle shifting, especially if I, because I tend to shoot in bursts. So I'm going to put so you can do, um, I'm going to set it to like a high speed uh, here. It'll do up to 11 frames per second. We can listen to. So when I shoot a lot of times, especially if there's people or motion involved, I'll do like a short burst. That's faster than I usually do. I usually do like, let's say, uh, where's that feature? Yeah, I got it. Select that point. Okay, drive. So I'm gonna move it down to like five frames per second. So I'll do a, a short burst. And those three frames, if I'm shooting with the electronic shutter, it, if, okay. So if I shoot three or four subsequent frames real fast on the electronic shutter, I find a lot of times I notice like a slight warp to the images, like they, it seems like it shifts. Like if I look at a, a corner of a building or something, it might like, like just very slightly, it would really be imperceptible. I think if you were just taking like one frame, but that's kind of the issue that I've noticed with the electronic shutter. Now, I don't know if there's something about this camera, but um, when I do the electronic shutter on my camera, it's completely silent. But when I do the electronic shutter on here, now I just got it to mechanical plus there. Okay. Can you hear that? I've got a mic down here. Can you hear that click? I don't know why it's making that sound. It's really odd. Uh, I, I don't like that at all. I don't know if it's just this particular camera. I'll have to find out from other people who have this model if it makes that sound. Um, it does. It makes that sound on the X100V. Huh. On this one, it's completely silent. I don't know what the difference is, if it has something to do with the rangefinder format. I'd be curious if the X-T3 or 4 makes that same sound or not. But I always thought one of the benefits of having an electronic shutter is if you're ever shooting in conjunction with video, which I do at least a couple times a year, I can shoot stills at the same time as the video crew and just have no sound at all. Um, so I like the custom customization options on this camera. There's a lot of buttons. There's a lot of dials. Um, I found on here, there's this nice dial, like right back by my thumb. 
and I can set that to the ISO. And it's nice to just in an instant, like in here, I've got to click to a menu and then move the ISO. But on here, I can just switch the ISO right where my thumb is at. So I have it, you know, aperture is aperture ring, shutter speed is here, um, ISO is here. And then I don't use the shutter release for the focus. I use the, um, the button on the back for focus. So focus here, and then the shutter release is just to activate the, um, the uh, exposure uh, um, reading and, uh, and release the shutter. So um, some of my, my criticisms are, I'm not used, it, it's personal style. So I think, you know, if you're switching from an SLR or an SLR style of a mirrorless camera over to a rangefinder style, it can take a little bit of adjustment getting used to shooting differently. You know, most people like to shoot like this with the rangefinder. So you've got, you know, it's easy to look around and you're just looking through the, um, you know, the, the rangefinder itself. And I really, I honestly, I prefer to shoot with my left eye. So that it's not really conducive to the rangefinder style as much. Um, also, again, because I'm not used to rangefinders, shooting through just the glass, I mean, it's like a rangefinder. You can see there's a white line around it where the, um, where your, what's in your frame, but you can see so much past that. And that's kind of, I'm used to seeing to the edge of my frame. Again, personal preference. I like seeing through to the edge of my frame and not necessarily what's beyond it. Cause then also just in the slightest in the corner, you're seeing your lens in like just the the bottom corner of of the viewfinder so like i don't know i know it's splitting hairs again this is personal preference you can i do like it's got the flip up you pull this trigger and then um the an lcd screen pops up so i think if i'm up closer you could probably see it yeah so the lcd screen comes up and then I'm seeing what exactly what I'm getting through the lens, which I like. So I'm not seeing what's beyond it. It's not, when you're shooting like this, eh, when you're shooting like this and you see the extra, it's not nearly as pronounced as when you put this on there. I mean, you're, it's to me, it's really hard to compose. Um, I'm not as crazy about that. Again, just like, I have decades of shooting with SLRs, so switching to rain, range finders is like a whole thing. It's got this mode where you see like a you see the regular range finder view, and then at the very bottom in the corner, there's like a preview mode. Like so, it looks like I'm looking through the the um, LCD screen. Well, I'm looking through a very very small portion of the LCD screen, and I can see what my exposure looks like. And I can also see what the framing looks like exactly, which is interesting. Um, and it doesn't really take up into your field of vision because it's only, your, it's where the lens is in your frame anyways. So that's kind of an interesting feature. But I find myself mostly shooting with the LCD up so I see exactly what my framing looks like, especially with the longer lens on there. Because looking through that rangefinder with the long lens, you're just seeing like, it's like you can see this much through the viewfinder, but you're only taking a picture of like, you know, like this much when you put a long lens on there. And it can be kind of uh, hard for me. Again, personal preference. So from what I had read about this camera beforehand, it's designed to be like a street shooter camera. Like, you know, all the greats use the rangefinder cameras and this is that. And so, um, some of the things they did to really play into that is they wanted it to feel like a film camera as much as possible. So they had certain features of it where, you know, on the back, you've got this, um, they have the film simulations, which, you know, Fujifilm has had for a while. Everybody knows about those. They're pretty cool. Um, personally, I don't really use them because I shoot in raw pretty much all the time. It, Personally, I don't really use them because I shoot in RAW most of the time. Um, 
but they're neat and I can see why people love them. And so what they did on this camera is the LCD on the screen. The LCD screen on the back is just this. This is its function primarily, as you can see the film stocks and um, I can move through those here. If I put them on here and move down, you can see, you know, Velvia, Astia, uh, what is that? Classic Chrome. So it's cool. Um, so I'll show them here. And then, yeah, I'll show them on this camera too. But and it's a cool feature. And these stay on when I turn the camera off. So the camera's off right now. And they still have the, uh, you can still see the film stock on the back. So then when you pick it back up, you know what it's on. So these are all ways that they're working to make this camera more like a film camera. And they kind of did things that are supposed to discourage you when you're out shooting from stopping and checking your images or chimping as some people call it. Do they still call it that? I don't know. Uh, when I was in journalism school, people called it chimping. So you can't look at the photos just flat on the LCD screen like this. If you're shooting with the um, LCD screen in the up mode here, you can review your images straight in there. So, you know, if you're used to doing quick reviews um, on the screen, you got to flip your screen down every time, which isn't necessarily convenient. You know, I don't review a ton, but if I'm moving from one lighting situation to another pretty quickly, I'll do a quick review. So I either have to like hold it up to my eye and review it in here, or I've got to flip the screen down anytime that I want to review it. Um, but it is, if you really want to have the convenience of digital and still have it feel like a film camera, you can go a pretty long way with that here. You can just shoot through the, the regular viewfinder without the LCD screen and not look at your images in the back and just wait until you get home <laughs> to look at the photos. But um, I'm gonna straight out, when I first had a camera that I could do a live review, no, sorry, let me stop, strike that, redo it. When I first had a camera where I could do a live view shooting, um, I thought, oh, that's an amateur thing. I'm not gonna do that. I'm a professional, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but I quickly saw the benefits of doing that, being able to um, especially do low light focusing. I can shoot in extremely low light very well and get you know nice sharp images because of the live view shooting and um, manual focus. And some of them can even do autofocus pretty well in those situations. But so, you know, back in the days of just shooting um, without the screens, I mean, there's a lot of times personally where I hold up my camera to get a higher angle. And so um, being able to, you know, on a camera like this, being able to flip the screen down, or if I'm really holding it up high, you know, I can flip the screen down and I don't have to guess at what I'm getting. I can see it right there. Um, that's nice, I like that. Same thing with straight overhead. You know, I like to shoot straight down on tabletops pretty often it's a common situation that you run into and you can't always get your you know face out over where you're at so having the screen there really helps and um you know you can't that's something you can't do here you know if you hold it up you can't see anything if you hold it over a table you know i can't see anything here now some people do a workaround where they'll turn the camera around but i mean like come on like with how much i want to do this I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna hold my camera upside down. It's too, it's too awkward. So um, now you can do, which is nice, because for me, probably the number one reason why I use the flip screen on my cameras is when I'm shooting a low angle so I don't have to lie on the ground. So I can, you know, hold my camera all the way on the ground and see what I'm shooting. You can still do that very easily with this camera. So. You know, if you never find yourself holding your camera up over your head to get a picture or holding it straight out to shoot straight down over something, then you're not going to miss the, that functionality. But for me, I like that functionality. I want to keep it. So that's kind of an area where, um, you know, I'm not crazy about the functionality of it.
So, um, and then the other thing, the buttons are very customizable, as I've said, which is great. But using that back focus, ergonomics are important to me. I like to feel comfortable when I'm holding the camera. Where I really want the, the back button to be for the autofocus is right here where my thumb is at. But it's over here. And I know it's, it's the smallest difference, but it makes a difference. If I was trying to decide between, let's say the X-T4, well, let's make it equal equivalent. If I'm trying to decide between the X-T3 and the X-Pro3, and the X-T3 had a button that was more comfortable, that would go in a long way. That would go a long way in making me choose the other camera. Um, but the other reason that that further stretch is an issue for me is like I said, um, I prefer to shoot with my left eye in the viewfinder. And so my, my focus, my thumb is literally right here when I'm shooting, it's right in front of my glasses, which if it, the button was where I wanted it to be, it'd be more like over here. So again, it's so small, but you know what? I want things to be the way that I want them. <laughs> so for the autofocus, I really had two options. I had this, the AEL, AFL button, or there's a little tiny, you almost can't see it because it's completely black, that button. I could make that button the um, autofocus and hold it up to my other camera just to just in case I can make that button my autofocus but neither of them were in a place that I really liked you know I want my thumb to be here and the one so I either had to go out to here or I had to go back here I opted for this one because I could find the button better it was a little more convenient this one is just it was hard for me to find it there's no like, um, it's completely smooth and there's almost no edge you can feel to it. Um, so I had a hard time finding it. I almost rather would have had it here because then it wouldn't be, see, because this is where my, if I use that closer button, this is where my hand would be. The further button, this is where my hand is when I'm shooting. So it's not ideal. But um, anyways, it was hard to locate for something that I use all the time. For a setting that you just change every once in a while, it's a convenient enough button. It's the, by default set to um, the film simulations. I like the multi-directional controller. It's easy for getting your autofocus points. Um, I do like the custom buttons. I liked this dial right here. I could set to ISO, whereas with my, my other camera, to change the ISO, I had to push one of the multi-controller buttons, push the button and then select the ISO. Whereas on here, I can just flip through them real quick. If I am inside and I go outside, I change the ISO real fast. Uh, so that's really convenient. This book I shot exclusively with my X-T20. Every picture in this book is X-T20 and the um, 23 millimeter F2. I didn't use any other lenses. I didn't use any other cameras. The print quality is good. This is all from the Fujifilm X-T20. Um, I don't know what you can see. I'm gonna try not to knock my cameras out of the floor. So, I mean, I'm really happy with the, you know, the contrast, the color, the sharpness, the detail. Um, let me find another. Yeah, these are like good color and everything. I mean, they're nice. The photos look good and they're nice and sharp. This was a project I did where I was, um, I lived near uh, a creek off a golf course where um, I went out to the creek with my kids and we were finding lost golf balls. And I thought they were landing in really interesting places and they looked really pretty. So I did a book like, you know, making art out of um, other people's uh, terrible golf shots. This is one of my favorites. and. I mean, the image quality is really, I mean, as good much as you can tell on a live. I mean, it looks, it's great. I'm really happy with it. So I think the image quality is there on these, on the Fujifilm cameras. It, this is the 56, the Fujifilm 56 F1.2. Here's the uh, lens here. It is 
very cool, very big glass. And um, all right, so I do mostly like a documentary style of photography. And I mean, if you ask me, this is really primarily a portrait lens. Um, the focusing while accurate is not particularly fast. And this is the standard version, the $1,000 version, and not the APD version. Um, I did not think that uh, for various reasons I wanted to try the APD um, because that kind of um, changed the, I'm not even gonna be able to say it right. It lets less light in than the standard version. So I wanted to have, you know, the most amount of light that I could coming through. But um, overall, you know, I did use this for some portraits and, um, you know, they turned out well. Um, it kind of, it was not super fast on the focusing. And I found when I was out shooting in more of a street style that, um, you know, it, it was sometimes difficult if I was trying to focus through things um, to really find the focus, even when I really made the autofocus point, you know, smaller. And, um, you know, just not like super fast focusing. So, I mean, I think this would be, if, if you're in more an area where you want something that's super precise, super fast, um, you know, this might not be the one, but as far as, um, you know, image quality is top notch, I am thinking I might, for me personally, like the compact size of the 50 2.0 a little bit better, but um, I don't know, we'll have to see. I'll try that one separately, so we'll see how it goes. It's a good lens, but I wasn't like super impressed with the speed of the focusing. So uh, yeah, all I've got really <laughs> for today. 